Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. In this episode, I spoke with my colleague and the lead developer of Axon Cloud, Yvonne Seeley, about protecting your sensitive data. We talked about the data protection module using Axon Framework and also without using Axon Framework. I hope you enjoyed this episode and let's have a listen. Hi, Yvonne. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Hello, Sarah. I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here to talk to me about some really important stuff. So today we're talking about sensitive data and uh, data protection module. So let's start by first figuring out why it's uh, worth talking about, especially in um, event-driven and message-driven systems, because I imagine that would be a little bit uh, of a challenge doing so in message-driven systems, because uh, you have different parts of the application that are decoupled so that um, we can scale these applications at a faster rate. And But on the flip side of it, I think um, it's difficult when we're talking about sensitive information because you're sending all of these messages to various uh, parties, basically, right? These messages are flying all over the place and it, uh, they can actually be handled by whoever can handle them. So how can we sort of remedy this <laughs> this difficult situation. <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about it? Yes, I can tell you a little bit about uh, about it. Uh, it's true. You don't have control over where the messages are, are flowing. But there's one thing that you do know, and that is that the events are stored in the event store. And the fact that the event store is a single source of truth makes it possible to encrypt sensitive data or a PII in the events and all the messages that are, that are the effect of that event will also have that PII encrypted. And can I ask the silly, que- silly question? Sorry to interrupt you. What is a PII? PII is person, uh, personal identified information. Cool. And it's it's the same as sensitive sensitive data. data. Very good. Yeah. Please continue. The f- Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that PII is encrypted on a message does not mean uh, that a component cannot handle it or forward it. Okay, that makes sense. And. Can, can you elaborate on this a little bit more about these components that are handling these? Yeah, that said, some components or users need to be able to access uh, the PII. And that's why a key needs to be generated to be able to decrypt uh, the PII. And this key is given to the consumers who are entitled to read the data. But when a component locks uh, PII, only encrypted values are shown and no sensitive data is leaked. And another advantage of applying encryption in the event it is that these events can be used for testing purposes, which uh, makes it easier to test your application in a real-life manner. Oh, nice. Okay. That that makes it uh, much better, I think, then, in that case, because you only, um, in, in, the, in our case, would really have to worry about the events, I would imagine, right? Not really um, anything else around it. So... Let's talk a little bit uh, first about what actually is considered sensitive data. So I, I can imagine that can mean various things to different people. So can you give me some examples of why uh, we would call something a sensitive data and why is it so important to protect these data? Uh, for instance, uh, social security numbers, uh, credit card data and account data are examples of uh, sensitive data. And sensitive data is data that can be linked to a person. For instance, a medical record isn't sensitive data un- unless it's linked to a particular person. Right. And if this sensitive data falls into the wrong hands, it could lead to fraud, identity theft, etc. Right. So I guess um, you you could say that really the sensitive data really depends on um, which sector we're talking about and what kind of information. Because in this case, I would imagine if you are... Um, say in real estate ba- uh, business, uh, your the address of a client can also be considered as a sensitive data. So really, uh, depending on what we are dealing with, what kind of data we're, we're handling, that could yeah. be assumed as, as sensitive. Yeah, it yeah. always depends, right? <laughs> as with anything, right? In software yeah. and, and everything else in life, it just depends, right? So now talking about this, um, I know there was a, um, in... 
uh, one of your blogs that you actually talked about uh, DP module, which we'll go back to it and talk about it a little bit more in detail. Uh, you mentioned that uh, to encrypt the data, we use uh, something called the crypto shredding. Can you tell me what that is? Yes, um, when crypto shredding is applied, data is destroyed by throwing away the cryptographic key and that cryptographic key protects the sensitive data. So if BII is encrypted, it can be decrypted using a key. And if this key is destroyed, the original value of that field cannot be recovered anymore. Oh, I see. So then where do we store the key? Um, yeah, this key is a very important subject. Yeah. So it should be regarded as sensitive data, like you save your passwords. So you could store the keys in a heavily protected database table, but you need to do that separately from the, from the customer data. But uh, using Vault would make more sense, in, in my opinion. Um, it's very important to make a backup of this store because without the keys, the personal data becomes unrecoverable. Okay, so don't lose your key, whatever you do, basically, right? <laughs> exactly. If you lose, don't lose the key, you lose everything, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this reminds me of one of the that my horror memories when I was a kid when I when I put the key in the trunk of our car and at that time we didn't have like a central key mechanism so that <laughs> the car was completely locked and <laughs> we actually it was it was a terrible thing because we were on a trip with several people and we were at the back of the line with with the car parked and blocking many people in the front so we lost the key so that held everybody up for like an entire half day <laughs> so yes. don't, don't lose your key. Anyways, going back to this, um, we can use the, so we have the data protection module, right? And yep. tell me a little bit about that. What is that? With the data protection module, you can declare your sensitive fields and let the module uh, encrypt these fields and decrypt these fields. Okay, that makes sense. So with data protection module, um, it uses the advanced encryption standard, which we would refer to as AES, um, as an encryption algorithm. Can you tell me why that is? Uh, yes, AES is a fast and secure form of encryption. And in the, in the US, this is a standard used to protect classified information. AES is implemented throughout the world to protect software and hardware. Okay. So what is the default or recommended key size? Because we have to give it a key size. So what is recommended and why? Uh, the default and recommended key size in the DP module is 256 bits. Mm -hmm. Other possible key sizes are 128 or 192 bits. For the 128 bits key size, 10 iterations are done before the ciphertext is determined. And an iteration consists of several processing steps for, for transforming the value into the encrypted value. Okay. And for 192 bits uh, key, it takes 12 iterations. And for 256 bits key size, 14 iterations are done. And 256 keys are used to protect the top secret documents. And that's why we chose it uh, to be the default in our um, DP module. Okay, okay. So it makes it a little bit um, easier and also much more secure to use right off the bat, which is really great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Crypto Engine. Can we define it and see what that is actually? <laughs> Yeah, the, the crypto engine is a driving part of the data protection module. Mm -hmm. A key can be generated, retrieved, or deleted by this component. You can override the key size or get the Java cipher object that performs the actual encryption. But to be honest, the only time that I use the crypto engine in practice is to delete the key, the, the key in case of a data subject uh, when he appeals for the right to be forgotten and okay. deletes the account. Okay, right. And... Um... Can we also talk about the uh, ways Crypto Engine can be implemented? So um, in the said blog, you, you mentioned six ways that it can be done. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yes, correct. Um, there are six implementations of the Crypto Engine. First, you have the Vault Crypto Engine, which uses HashiCorp Vault uh, to be as a key store. You can use the in-memory Crypto Engine when you're running your unit tests and uh, you don't mind that your keys are lost after the test. Okay. You can use the JPA crypto engine or JDBC um, for just plain J JDBC crypto engine to use it in a, in, a, in a database. Okay. 
Um, you can also use the Java Keystore crypto engine and the PKCS11 crypto engine, which uses hardware to uh, encrypt uh, your data. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, let's talk about a, a couple of these a little bit, a little bit more into detail. But um, prior to that, events. Since we are storing the sensitive data inside of our events, and they cannot be deleted. How can we meet this right to be forgotten requirement? Yeah, good question. Events cannot be deleted and they contain a lot of valuable information than just the sensitive data. And if the key that can be used to decrypt sensitive data is deleted, only the fields that are marked as personal data become unreadable and the rest of the event data can be used for statistical purposes, for instance. Okay. And it's even possible to encrypt a part of a data field and leave, for instance, the three digits of the last three digits of a bank account number or the year of birth in the date of birth. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you can provide a replacement value provider for it. Okay, I see. So... Going to Axon a little bit and talking a little bit about Axon specifics, how does Axon data protection module work inside of an Axon framework application? Yeah, the first thing to know is that the data protection module is com commercial software. And after you obtain the license, you will be provided with a jar, a license and documentation. And if you use Axon framework, you just need to add the correct dependency, which is the one that matches your version of the Axon framework. You can then configure the, the, the crypto engine of your choice and then use the field encrypting serializer as, as the event serializer. And this field encrypting serializer will automatically encrypt all the event attributes that are marked as personal data using the attribute annotated as the data subject ID, which is another attribute present in the event, like an account ID. And after encryption, the event will be serialized using the configured serializer for your application. Okay. So um, it's important, I guess, to note that yes, Axon Framework is open source and freely available to everybody to use. However, if you do need to protect your sensitive data and using the data protection module, that's something that's commercialized and you do have to purchase the license for it to be able to use it, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So Going back, if I understand correctly, we can configure the application with several implementations of the crypto engine. Can you explain a little bit about um, the JPA crypto engine and the Vault crypto engine? Yes, of course. Uh, the JPA crypto engine stores the key in a table in a relational database. And in that case, you need to configure and create the key store. And this key store has two columns, the data subject ID and the key itself. And the Vault Crypto Engine uses HashiCorp Vault to save the keys. In Vault, secrets can be managed. So the decryption keys are regarded as a secret. So you can use the key value secret to, uh, engine to store a key as a value <laughs> and using a data subject ID as the key. As the key. So again, don't use lose your keys. <laughs> We'll go back to don't lose same. your keys. Yes, same <laughs> here. Same here. Cool. All right. Um, now, can we focus a little bit on uh, using this data projection module without Axon? So yes. it's, still, it's commercialized, you still have to purchase and have the license for it. But if you're not using Axon framework, can we still use it? You can still use it. And mm -hmm. it's still it's, it's also used for, a different, uh, for other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, besides the crypto engine and the field encrypting serializer, the data protection module also pro provides a field encryptor. And this class can encrypt and uh, decrypt classes uh, having the DP module annotations. Okay. And this field encryptor is idempotent. It will not encrypt any uh, value that is already encrypted. Mm -hmm. And it will also not decrypt any uh, value that is already decrypted. And also the field encryptor is uh, null safe. Okay. All right. Um, lots to remember. <laughs> but I'm glad we're recording this so you can go back to it and listen. Now, Talking about data protection module annotations, what are they? So we, we did talk about some fields, but can we talk a, a little bit more about the annotation? Yeah, I already talked about the personal data and the data subject annotation. Yeah. But besides that, you also have the deep personal data annotation to tell the data protection module that there are annotations inside objects that you are using in your root mm -hmm. objects. 
Mm -hmm. And um, we had a short discussion a little bit ago about uh, deep personal data and personal data. Can you uh, specify the, the difference between the two as well? Yeah, so if you, for instance, have in your object, you have an address mm -hmm. and you have the street in the address uh, marked as personal data, you need to tell the other object that in the address there is more personal data to be found. So it, you should annotate it with the personal data. Okay, gotcha. So what about um, old data in old events? Because you... we usually talk about this possibility of moving from old legacy systems into microservices into event source uh, systems. And within those legacy systems, I can imagine there's a lot of data that's old and hasn't been maybe updated that are sensitive, that needs a little bit of love and attention. How can we do that? And also within event source services, like if we have something from two years ago, how can we go back and the good news is, is if, if you have legacy systems that do not use events, you can just create the new events uh, with the encrypted values. Okay. So there you don't have an issue. So then but you simply just remove the data from the le legacy systems and exactly. you put it into your current events and voila, problem solved. Yes. Okay, great. Exactly. But if you already have an uh, event store, yeah, events are append only, and in theory, you cannot modify events. Ah. But it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's just something you would not do on a daily basis. There could be reasons, though, to do so, and having non-encrypted sensitive data in your event store could be one of them. Yeah, and so in that case, when we talk about event sourcing, we're usually going back and recreating those events, right? So for instance, if uh, you realize that, hey, I have an event that uh, contains some sensitive data from three years ago, and I have to protect that data now, going back and recreating these events. So I would imagine you would need something like, um, I don't know, version two of all of these events, or uh, you can use... What am I forgetting the yeah, name? But yeah, but 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 still oh, casters. Um, <laughs> podcasters. Yeah, still still the the uh, uh, sensitive data will still be in your event. So that wouldn't wouldn't help you. The only thing that I can think of is to do a migration from uh, your old event store into a new one and then uh, remove your old event store. But that what I said, that's not something you do on a daily basis. Yeah, and because you don't want to delete your events at the end of the day, exactly. right? We, we, mm -hmm. We're always uh, talking about events being immutable and don't touch them and so forth, so you really don't want to delete them. So I guess the the take from this, uh, from this, I guess, example would be if you have something from the past, then if you can somehow manage it and remove it from the event store, you can do it. Otherwise, just I guess, move on. Yes. Um, yeah, you should also always think about how to, to solve these kind of things. And yeah, sometimes you need to break the rule and say, okay, I have to migrate mm -hmm. uh, my event store into a new one. So I have a question for you that um, uh, it's not necessarily within the data protection module, but we did briefly mention uh, you can use upcasters. Can you give me an example of how we can do that? Uh, yeah, I can, but it, I think it's it's a bit off topic here. <laughs> so if we if we are recreating our events, though, do we need to have an upcaster? Um, if you migrate uh, to a new ev event store, no, you don't need an upcaster okay. anymore. Okay, no. okay. So that that answers my question a bit. So that's great. Um, <laughs> so going back to crypto shredding, is that enough to protect your data? Because we have. Some who would say, well, uh, it's only a matter of time and technology before it can be decrypted. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, um, keys can be cracked and uh, sensitive uh, data values can be stolen. And yeah, that's, it may not be today, but it could happen in, in the future. Yeah. Um, and then you can also store your sensitive data somewhere else so you can delete it uh, easily and permanently. And you can use the replacement feature that I talked about earlier yeah. in the data protection module to add a reference to it. And with the key size that you talked about uh, a little bit ago, I think um, from what I've read, it's extremely difficult to to crack yeah. it. So yeah. it's it's not something that you need to 
I guess, worry about for the next maybe like 200 years. <laughs> yeah, you cannot, you, you do not have a bow to look into the future. So it's, right. it's always hard to, to, to say such such things. But um, yeah. Yeah, we need to to cope with uh, with the fact if it happens. So in that case, um, if somebody has um, some sort of extremely sensitive data that they don't want to um, risk putting it into, uh, you know, using crypto shredding, for instance, what is the alternative? Do we have an alternative? You can keep your sensitive data somewhere else and... Uh, on a different uh, place, uh, fold, whatever, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. can delete it permanently. Okay. And then you can use the replacement uh, feature in the DP module to uh, to reference to it. Okay. All right. So that's, there are always options, which is, which is really great. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Yes. Uh, I wrote a blog, which you can find on our blog overview at exonic.io slash um, blog dash overview. And you can find some code snippets there, and I, I will explain about how to do how you can use the data protection module and how you can test your code. Yeah, which which is really really valuable because you also talk about um, the some of the dependencies that you might need to put in your code. So um, it's it's a really detailed blog, which I highly highly recommend um, everybody to go ahead and read. And I'll uh, put in the link for that blog also um, inside of the description of this. Uh, specific podcast recording, which is uh, going to be easy for people to go back and take a look at it. So fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for talking about this. And I really, really always appreciate you going to, through some of these really uh, difficult and more uh, challenging topics. So I appreciate the time. Okay, you are welcome. Thanks, Yvonne. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Yvonne. Please join me next time as I discover more about Axon in its ecosystem. Until then, have a great time and happy coding! Bye.